I mostly read public domain books here on Glenn Reads Books to You, and they were written a long time ago, so they're usually racist or sexist or bigoted. But in there somewhere is a story, and uh, that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist. But they might have uh, adult language or adult situations, like, uh, oh, I don't know, making sex. Uh, So that's your warning. But I'm sure you're grown up enough to handle it. Uh, Don't write to me complaining. Well, I come back from my trip to New Jersey with a cold. Everyone in New Jersey is diseased. Oh, God damn it. All right, fine. Uh, Take a little seat. It's Halloween. Eh, I'm I'm surprised to see you here, Uh, of all things. You'd come on Halloween night, where I'm going to uh, serenade you with two scary stories from Algernon Blackwood. Uh, Welcome to the Glenn Reads Books to You Mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording in my basement. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories this week. Uh, we're going to read two Halloween stories by Algernon Blackwood. Want to hear a little bit about the author? Sure, you seem inquisitive. Uh, Algernon Blackwood was born the 14th of March, 1869, and he died the 10th of December, 1951. He was an English broadcasting narrator, journalist, novelist, and short story writer, and among the most prolific ghost story writers in the history of the genre... Blackwood had a varied career, working as a dairy farmer in Canada, eh? and he also uh, operated a hotel for six months, and as a newspaper reporter in New York City, a uh, bartender, um, weirdly model, journalist for the New York Times, private secretary, businessman, and violin teacher. Businessman's pretty vague. Want to hear some fun facts? Eh, there's not really anything out there. He was born uh, at the 14th, I always said that. Blackwood rebelled against his strong Catholic upbringing and began studying burp, oriental religions, and the occult, later joining several occult societies. Then he uh, reached 20, this is all before 20, his father sent him to Canada, and there he spent several years before entering the U.S. and becoming a reporter for the New York Sun. I like that his dad's like, ah, you're some kind of weird Satanist, Uh, off to Canada with you, but oh, he escaped, and then he worked for the New York Sun. Returning to Britain in the late 1890s, he soon began turning some of his strange experiences into stories, beginning with A Haunted Island, a ghost story set in the remote Canadian backwoods. Uh, An acquaintance sent uh, these stories to a publisher, and the result was The Empty House, soon followed by many more weird story collections and some truly strange and powerful novels. Storyteller, mystic, adventurer... Radio and television personality, uh, Algernon Blackwood has been all these in his rich and varied lifetime. In fact, as he revealed to his friends, most of his stories were based on actual events. And by the time of his death in 1951, he had become one of the greatest writers of the supernatural fiction of the 20th century. Ah, crap. Uh, I still have a lot of time before the grandfather clock goes off. Usually the grandfather clock is supposed to let me know when to shut up so we can start reading the story uh, because people hated my long, rambling intros. Uh, But now I've got nothing to say. Uh, I went to New Jersey for a wedding. Now my wife and I came back horribly sick. Uh, New Jersey people are diseased. Oh, thank God. Well, with that, let's begin our Halloween episode uh, uh, get down to the library where I can read to you these stories. Well, there you go. Get settled. I hope you appreciate all the pumpkins I put in my library all the pumpkins that I carved about three weeks ago, and uh, now they're all humid and making all the books get wet on my shelves here in the library of my mansion. Um, Next time I'll try to wait till it's closer to Halloween to actually carve the pumpkins, but man, was it cozy and creepy in here. I was having a very fun time with the aesthetic, but uh, now I'm paying the price. Yes, I know the leather chair you're sitting in is wet. Uh, It's fine. Let me read to you. A suspicious gift. Blake 
had been in very low water for months, almost underwater part of the time, due to the circumstances he was fond of saying were no fault of his own. Oh, as he sat writing in his room on the, quote, third floor back, unquote, of a New York boarding house, part of his mind was busily occupied in wondering when his luck was going to turn again. It was uh, it was his room only in the sense that uh, he paid the rent. Two friends, uh, one, uh, a little Frenchman, and the other, a big Dane, shared it with them, both hoping eventually to contribute something towards expenses, but so far not having accomplished this result, uh, they had two beds only, and the third being a mattress uh, that they slept upon in turns. A week at a time. Uh, a good deal of their regular quote-unquote feeding consisted of oatmeal, potatoes, and sometimes eggs, all of which they cooked on a strange utensil, which they had contrived to fix into the gas yet. Uh, occasionally, when dinner failed them altogether, oh, they swallowed a little raw rice and drank hot water for the bathroom on the top of it, and when they made wild rice for bed so as to get to sleep while the sensation of false repletion was still there, uh, oh, for sleep and hunger are slight acquaintances, as they well knew. Fortunately, all New York houses supply with hot air, oh, and they only had to open a grating in the wall to get, uh, get a plentiful, if not a wholesome, amount of heat. Oh, through loneliness in a big city is a real punishment, and as they had severely learnt their, uh, their cost, their experiences... Three in a small room for several months had revealed to them horrors of quite another kind. Their nerves had suffered according to the temperament of each. But uh, but on this particular evening, as Blake sat scribbling by the window uh, that was not cracked, and Dane, oh, and the Frenchman, oh, his companions in adversity, oh, were in wonderful luck. They had both been asked out uh, to a restaurant to dine with a friend who had also held out one of them a chance to work and remuneration. They would not be back till late, and when they did come, uh, they were pretty sure to bring in supplies of one kind or another, for the Frenchman never could resist the offer of a glass of absinthe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And this meant that he'd be able to help himself plentifully from free lunch counters, which all New York buyers were furnished. And to which any purchaser of a drink is entitled to help himself and devour on the spot, or a... Uh, carry away casually in his hand for consumption elsewhere. That's weird. Thousands of unfortunate men get their sole substance in this way in New York City. And experience soon teaches where, for the price of a single drink, a man can take away almost a meal of chip potatoes, sausage, bits of bread, oh, 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 and even eggs. Ah, the Frenchman and the Dane knew their way about, and Blake looked forward to supper more or less substantial before pulling his mattress out of the cupboard and turning it upon the floor for the night. Meanwhile, he could enjoy a quiet, lonely evening in the room all to himself. Oh, in the daytime, he was a reporter on an evening newspaper of sensational lying habits. His work was chiefly in the police courts, and his spare hours at night were not too tired or empty. Oh, he wrote sketches eh, and stories for the magazines that very rarely saw the light of day uh, on their printed and uh, paid-for sentences. On this particular occasion, he was deep in the most involved tale of psychological character, and he had just worked his way into a sentence, or sentence, a uh, set of sentences, uh, that completely baffled and modeled him. Nice fairly out of his depth, and his brain was too poorly supplied with blood to invent a way out again. The story could have been interesting had he written it simply. This is a very boring intro to the story. Keeping to facts and feelings and not diving into difficult analysis or motive of character, which is quite beyond him, uh, for it's largely eh, eh, autobiographical, eh, bi bi autobiographical, there, I said it. He was meant to describe the adventures of a young Englishman who had come to grief in the usual manner on a Canadian farm. Now he's writing from life for real. We just learned about that. He had subsequently become a barkeep, a sub-editor on a Methodist magazine, and a teacher of French and German to clerks at 25 cents per hour, a model for artists. God, he's literally talking about his actual real life. Good thing I learned all that crap in the beginning. Uh, a super on the stage, and finally, a wanderer to the gold fields. Blake scratched his head, dipped the pen in the ink pot, stared out through the blindless windows, and sighed deeply. His thoughts kept wandering to food, beefsteak, and steaming vegetables. Uh, the smell of cooking that came from a lower floor through the kitchen windows was constant torment to him. <clears throat> oh, he pulled himself together and again attacked the problem. 
dot, dot, dot. For with some people, he wrote, the imagination is so vivid as to be almost an extension of consciousness. Four dots. Uh, but here, he was stuck absolutely. Uh, he was not quite sure what he meant by the words. And uh, how to finish the sentence puzzled him into a blank incantation. Oh, it's a difficult point to decide, for it seemed to come inappropriately uh, at this point in the story. And he did not know whether to leave it as it stood, uh, change it around a bit, or uh, take it out altogether. Yeah, uh, it might spoil its chances of being accepted. Editors, oh, oh, they're such clever men. But to rewrite the sentence was a grind. And he was so tired and sleepy. And after all, eh, what did it matter? People who were clever would force a meeting into it. People who were not clever would eh, pretend. You know, he knew of no other class of readers. So he let it stay and go on with the action of the story. Uh, he put his head in his hands and began to think hard. Eh, this is one of those things. It's kind of like uh, anything Stephen King ever writes. Uh, when an author writes about uh, the main character being an author, you kind of can't identify with them. It's just some uh, flippity gibbet who's stumbling into a situation. You don't think of it like a, it's, it, it's like a steel worker or an auto mechanic or just someone that works behind the counter at a store. It's always got to be an author all the time. I don't know why they masturbate so much in these stories. His mind soon passed from thought to reverie. Oh, he fell to wondering when his friends would find work and relieve him of the burden. Oh, yeah, he acknowledged it as such, of keeping them and letting another man wear his best clothes on alternate Sundays. Oh, he wondered when his quote-unquote luck would turn. Well, there was uh, one or two influential people in New York whom he could see if he had to dress, get a dress suit and the other conventional uniforms. Uh, his thoughts ran on far ahead, and at the same time, by a sort of double process, far behind as well. His home in the old country rose up before him, and he saw the lawn and the cedars and sunshine. Oh, he, he looked through the familiar windows and saw the clean, swept rooms. Oh, his story began to suffer. The psychological masterpiece would not make much progress unless he pulled up and dragged his thoughts back to the treadmill. But he could no longer care. Once he had got as far as the cedar and the sunshine on it, he could never get back again. For all he cared, the troublesome sentence might run away and go into someone else's pages, or, uh, or be snuffed out altogether. There came a gentle knock at the door. Oh, and Blake started. The knock was repeated louder. Uh, who in the world could it be at this late hour of the night? Uh, on the floor above, he remembered there lived another Englishman, a foolish, second-rate creature, who sometimes came in and made himself objectionable with endless and silly chatter. Ah, oh, but it was an Englishman for all that, and Blake always tried to treat him with politeness, realizing that he was lonely in a strange land. But tonight, <clears throat> all the people in the world, he didn't want to be bored with Perry's crackle, as he called it, and, uh, and the come in, he gave an answer to the second knock, was uh, no very cordial sound of welcome to it. Uh, uh, however, the door opened to response, and the man came in. Blake did not turn round once, but the other advanced to the center of the room, but without speaking. Then Blake knew it was not his enemy, Perry, and turned around. <laughs> oh, oh, that burp slipped out of me. Did you hear that? It's like I'm possessed. Ah, uh, on this Halloween night, the, the, the spirit of reading is coming out, coming out of my mouth, against my will. I'm possessed by it. He saw a man about 40 standing in the middle of the carpet, but standing sideways so that he did not present a full face. He wore an overcoat buttoned up to the neck, and on the felt hat which he had in front of him, fresh raindrops glistened, and in the other hand he carried a small black bag. Blake, Blake gave him a good look, and then came to the conclusion that he might be a secretary or a chief clerk or a confidential man of sorts. What's a confidential man exactly? Should I look it up? I'm just going to waste all of our time. Confidential man. Let's see what comes up. Nothing. All right. Well, that was a waste of time. I guess just like a lawyer, maybe. <clears throat> ah, he was shabby, respectable looking person. This is some total of the first impression. Gained the moment his eyes took in that it was not Perry. Oh, the second impression was, uh, well, less pleasant and reported at once something was wrong. Uh, though otherwise young and inexperienced, Blake, thanks or curses to the police court training, knew more about common criminal black guardianism. I'm going to look that up. I don't think that's an actual word. Nothing. 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 
Okay, it's not a real word. I'm sure it's probably racist. All old books are racist. Then most men of 50. He recognized that there was somewhere a suggestion of this undesirable world, world about the man. But there was more than this. There was something singular about him. Something uh, far out of the common. Uh, though for the life of him, Blake could not say where it lay. The fellow was out of the ordinary, and in some very undesirable manner. Oh, all this that takes so long to describe. Yes, it's taking a long time to describe. Blake saw with the first and second glance the man at once began to speak in a quiet, respectful voice. Uh, are you Mr. Blake? He asked. I am. Mr. Arthur Blake? Yes. Mr. Arthur Herbert Blake, persisted the other with emphasis on the middle name. That is my full name, Blake answered, simply adding as he remembered his manners. Uh, but won't you, won't you sit down first, please? The man advanced with a curious sideways motion, like a crab, and took a seat on the edge of the sofa. Oh, yeah, he put his hat on the floor at his feet and uh, still kept the bag in his hand. I, uh, I come to you from a well-wisher, he went on in oily tones without lifting his eyes. Uh, Blake, in his mind, ran quickly all over the people he knew in New York who might possibly have said such a man uh, while waiting for him to supply the name. But the man had come to a full stop and was waiting, too. A uh, 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 well-wisher of mine, repeated Blake, not quite knowing what else to say. Yeah, just so, replied the other, with, still with his eyes on the floor. A well-wisher of yours. Uh, uh, a man, or, he felt himself blushing, uh, or a woman. That, said the man shortly, I cannot tell you. You can't tell me, exclaimed the other, wondering what this is coming to next. <clears throat> uh, who in the world this mysterious well-wisher would be who sent so discreet and mysterious a messenger? I, I can't tell you the name, replied the man firmly. Those are my instructions. But I bring you something from this person, and I am to give it to you, to take a receipt for it, and then to go away without answering any questions. Blake stared very hard. The man, however, never raised his eyes above the level of the second china knob on the chest of the drawers opposite. The giving of a receipt sounded like, uh, money. Could it be that some of his influential friends had heard of his plight? Oh, there are possibilities that made his heart beat. At length, however, he found his tongue, for this strange creature was determined apparently to say nothing more until he had heard from him. Uh, then, uh, uh, uh what do you got for me? Uh, please, he asked bluntly. By way of answer, the man proceeded to open the bag, and he took out a parcel wrapped loosely in brown paper, and about it, a size of a, uh, a large book, and he... It was tied with string, and the man seemed unnecessarily long on tying the knot. And then at last, the string was off, and the paper unfolded. There appeared a series of smaller packages inside. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's going to be one of those gag gifts. Uh, and the man took them out very carefully, almost as if they'd been alive. Blake thought it, and, and set them in a row upon his knees. Uh, they were dollar bills. Blake, all in a flutter, craned his neck forward a little to try and make out their uh, denomination. He read plainly, the figures, one hundred. There are ten thousand dollars here, said the man quietly. Oh, the other could not suppress a little cry. Ah, uh, uh, they are for you. Blake simply gasped. Ten thousand dollars, he replete, uh, repeated. A uh, queer feeling growing up in his throat. Ten thousand. Are you sure? I mean... Are you sure they're for me? He stammered. He felt quite silly with excitement and grew more so with every minute. And the man maintained a perfect silence. Uh, was it not a dream? Wouldn't the man put them back in the bag presently and say it was a mistake and they were meant for somebody else? Oh, he could not believe his eyes or ears. Yet, in a sense, uh, it was possible. He had read of such things in books. Oh, and even came across them his experience of the courts, the erratic and generous philanthropist who is determined to do good deed and get no thanks or acknowledgement for it. Still, it seemed almost incredible. His troubles began to melt away like bubbles of the sun. Oh, he thought of the other fellows when they came in and that they'd be able to tell him. And he thought of the German landlady and the arrears for arrears, arrears of rent, of regular food and clean linen and books. And music. Oh, the chance of getting into some respectable business of, well, as of many things is possible to think of when excitement and surprise fling wide open the gates of imagination. The man, meanwhile, began quietly to count over the packages aloud from one to ten. 
And then I count the bills in each separate packet. Uh, also, from 1 to 10, yes, there were 10 little heaps, each containing 10 bills of $100 denomination that made $10,000. Blake had never seen so much money in a single lump in his life before. And for many months of privation and discomfort, he had not known the quote-unquote feel of a $20 note. Yeah, it feels the same as anything else. Uh, much less of a $100 one. Feels about the same. He heard them crackle under the man's fingers, and it was like crisp laughter in his ears. And the bills were evidently new <coughs> and unused. But uh, side by side with the excitement caused by the shock of such an event, Blake's caution acquired a uh, uh, by a year of vivid New York experiences. Meanwhile, beginning to assert itself. It all seemed just too much out of the likely in order for things to be quite right. The police courts had taught him the amazing ingenuity of the criminal mind, as well as something of the plots and devices by which the unwary are beguiled into the dark places where blackmail may be levied with impunity. Uh, New York, as a matter of fact, just at the time, it was literally undermined with the secret ways of blackmail. All the green goodsmen and the other police uh, protected abominations. And the only weak point in the supposition is that it was part of such proceeding was the selection of himself, a poor newspaper reporter, as a victim. Well, it did seem absurd, but then the whole thing was so out of the order. And he thought uh, at once of having entered his mind, but not easily got rid of. Uh, Blake resolved to be very cautious. The man, uh, meanwhile, though he never appeared to raise his eyes from the carpet, had been watching him closely all the time. Uh, if you will give me a receipt, I will leave the money at once, he said, with just a vestige of impatience, impatience in his tone. Or as if he were anxious to bring the matter to a conclusion as soon as possible. But uh, you say it is quite impossible for you to tell me the name... Burp, my God, I'm falling apart. I have a cold. Uh, my well-wisher, or why she eh, eh, sends me such a large sum of money in this extraordinary way. The money is sent to you because you are in need of it, returned the other. And it is a present without conditions of any sorts attached. Uh, you had to give me a receipt only to satisfy the sender that has reached your hands. The money will never be asked of you again. Eh, Blake noticed two things of this answer. First, uh, that the man was not to be caught into betraying the sex of the well-wisher. And secondly, that he was in some meh, hurry to complete the transaction. For he was now giving reasons, attractive reasons, you know, why he should accept the money and make out with the receipt. Suddenly, it flashed across his mind that if he took the money uh, and gave the receipt before a witness... Yeah, not the very disastrous becoming of the affair. Uh, it would protect him against blackmail uh, if this was, after all, a plot of some sort with blackmail in it. Uh, whereas if the man were a madman or a criminal who was getting rid of a portion of his ill-gotten gains to divert suspicion, or if any other improbable explanation turned out to be true, uh, there was no great harm done, and he could hold the money till it was claimed or advertised <clears throat> for it in the newspapers. His mind rapidly ran over these possibilities, though, of course, under the stress of excitement, he was unable to weigh any of them properly. Uh, then he turned to his strange visitor again and said quietly, I'll take the money, although I must say it seems to me a very unusual transaction, and I will give you for it such a receipt as I think proper under the circumstances. Uh, a proper receipt is all I want, was the answer. And I mean by that uh, a receipt before a proper witness. Perfectly satisfactory, interrupted the man, his eyes still on the carpet. Only it must be dated and headed with your address uh, here in the correct way. Blake could see uh, no possible objection to this, uh, so he at once proceeded to obtain a witness. Uh, the person he had in mind was Mr. Barclay, who occupied the room. Ooh, like Barclay Banks. Is this how Barclay Banks started? Is from this weird transaction from a supernatural figure? That would be so cool. Who occupied the room above his own? Uh, an old gentleman who had retired from the business and who, the landlady always said, uh, was a miser and kept large sums of secret in his room. He was, at any rate, a perfectly respectable man who would make an admirable witness to a transaction of this sort. Blake eh, made an apology and rose to fetch him. Crossed to the room in front of the sofa where sat the, uh, sat the man in order to reach the door. As he did so, he saw for the first time the other side of the visitor's face. The side that had always been so carefully turned away from. Ow! Ow, there's a broad smear of blood down the skin from the ear to the neck. It glistened 
in the gaslight. Blake never knew how he managed to smother the cry that sprang to his lips, but smother it he did. Well, money. In a second, he was at the door, his knees trembling, his mind in a sudden and dreadful turmoil. The main object, uh, so far as he could recollect afterwards, was to escape from the room as he had noticed nothing, uh, so as not to arouse other suspicions. The man's eyes were always on the carpet, and uh, probably, Blake hoped, had not noticed the consternation that must have been written plainly on his face. At any rate, he uh, had uttered no cry. In another second, he would have been in the passage, and when he suddenly met a pair of wicked, staring eyes fixed intently and with a cunning smile upon his own. Oh, is the other's face in the mirror, calmly watching his every movement. Oh, instantly, all his powers of reflection blew, flew into the winds, and he thought only of the desirability to get help at once. He tore upstairs, his heart in his mouth, and Barclay must come to his aid. This matter was serious, perhaps horribly serious. Taking the money or giving a receipt or having anything at all to do with it became an impossibility. Here was crime. He felt certain of it. <clears throat> In three bounds, he reached the next landing and began to hammer the old miser's door as if his very life depended on it. For a long time, he could get no answer. His fists seemed to make no noise. It might have been knocking on Cotton wool, yeah. and the thought dashed through his brain that it was all just like the terror of a nightmare. Barclay, evidently, was still out, or else sound asleep. But the other simply could not wait a minute longer in suspense. He turned the handle and walked into the room. At first he saw nothing for the darkness. Oh, I made sure the owner of the room was out, but the moment the light from the passage began to a little to disperse the gloom, oh, he saw the old man, to his immense relief, lying asleep in bed. Blake opened the door to its widest to get more light, then he walked quickly to the bed, and he saw this figure more plainly, and he noted that it was dressed and lay upon the outside of the bed. Uh, it, it struck him, too, that he was sleeping in a very odd, almost unnatural position. Something clutched at his heart as he looked closer. He stumbled over a chair and found the matches, calling upon Barclay the whole time to, to wake up and come downstairs to them. Oh, he blundered across the floor, a dreadful thought in his mind, and uh, lit the gas over the table. And it seemed strange that there was no movement to reply to his shouting. But it was no longer seemed strange that the length he turned into a full glare of the gas, and he saw the old man lying huddled up in a ghastly heap on the bed, his throat cut across from ear to ear. Oh, and all over the carpet laid new dollar bills, crisp and clean, like those he had left downstairs and strewed about in little heaps. Eh, uh, well, for a moment, Blake, uh, Blake stood stock still, bereft of all power of movement. By the next, his courage returned and fled from the room and dashed downstairs, taking five steps at a time, and he reached the bottom, tore along the passage to his room, determined at any rate to seize the man and prevent his escape till help came. But when he got to the end of the little landing, he found his door had been closed. Uh, so he seized the handle, fumbling with it uh, in his violence, and uh, felt slippery and kept turning under his fingers, not opening the door. Uh, and fully half a minute passed before he yielded and let him in headlong. Uh, at first glance, he saw the room was empty, and the man was gone, exclamation point. Scattered upon the carpet <clears throat> lay a number of bills. Beside them, uh, half hidden under the sofa where the man had sat, he saw... A pair of gloves, thick leathern gloves, and a butcher's knife. Even from the distance where it stood, the blood stains on both were easily visible. Uh, dazed and confused by the terrible discoveries of the last few minutes, Blake stood in the middle of the room, overwhelmed, unable to think or move. Unconsciously, he must have passed his hand over the forehead of the natural gesture of perplexity, for he noticed that the skin felt wet and sticky. His hand was covered with blood, and when he rushed in terror to the looking glass, he saw that there was a broad red smear across his face and forehead, and then he remembered the slippery handle on the door, and he knew that it had been carefully moistened. In an instant, the whole plot became as clear as daylight. Oh! He was so spellbound with horror that the sort of numbness came over him, and he became uh, very near to fainting, and he was in a condition of utter helplessness. He had anyone come into the room that minute and called him by name, he would simply have dropped to the floor in a heap. Oh, yeah, oh, God, if the police were to come now, he thought, crashed through his brain like thunder. At the same moment, uh, almost before he had time to appreciate a quarter of its significance, there came a loud knocking on the front door below. Oh, the bell rang with a dreadful clamor. Men's voices were heard talking excitedly, and presently heavy steps began to come up the stairs in the direction of his room. Oh, it was the police. 
And all Blake could do was to laugh foolishly to himself and wait till they were upon him. He could not move, uh, nor speak. In his face, oh, he stood face to face with the evidence of this horrid crime. His hands and his face smeared with blood of his victim. And there was a uh, standing when the police burst open the door and came noisily into the room. Ah, here it is, cried a voice he knew. Uh, third floor back, and the fellow caught red-handed. It was the man with the bag leading in the two policemen. Hardly knowing what he was doing in the fearful stress of conflicting emotions, he made a step forward, but before he had time to make a second one, he felt the heavy hand of the law descend upon his shoulders at once as two policemen moved up to seize him. At the same moment, a voice of thunder cried in his ear, Wake up, man, wake up, here's supper. And the good news, too. Well, Blake turned at the start in his chair, and he saw Dane. Very red in the face, standing beside him, a hand on his shoulder. And a little further back, yeah, he saw the Frenchman leering happily at him over the end of the bed, a bottle of beer in one hand and a paper package in the other. Yeah, he rubbed his eyes, glancing from one to the other, and then got up sleepily to fix the wire arrangement on the gas jet to boil water for cooking of the eggs, which the Frenchman was in a momentary danger of letting drop on the floor. Well, that was delightful. Why don't we take a little break? Uh, we've already been reading for 30 minutes. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we go downstairs in the basement where I can tell you about the latest upcoming books from Penguin Random House. Ah, there you are, and me here in this basement... This trippy basement with a lot of sound effects to really give you that basement feel. Here on Halloween night. I have a cold. I didn't have it in me to do the whole thing where I put in sound effects of like spooky thunderstorms. And <clears throat> this is all you get this year. I went to New Jersey. And if anything scary and terrifying about tonight is the fact that I can whisper to you that I went to New Jersey and everyone there is diseased. And I came back with a cold. A cold that allows me to tell you about a latest upcoming book from Penguin Random House called Have I Told You This Already? by Laura Graham. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. Uh, uh, about this book uh, from the beloved star of Gilmore Girls and the New York Times best-selling author of Talking As Fast As I Can comes an insightful, honest, funny, and moving collection of captivating stories. That's from BuzzFeed. Uh, you want to hear what E! Online has to say? Graham is fast and furiously funny. Where Graham leads, we will definitely follow. I heard people say that about Trump. Well, let's learn about this book. Lauren Graham has graced countless television screens with her quick-witted characters and her hilarious talk show appearances. Her hilarious talk show appearances, earning a reputation as a pop culture icon. Oh, obviously, yes, everyone knows about who she is, who always has something to say. In her latest book, have I told you this already? Graham combines her signature sense of humor with down-to-earth storytelling, like a like a grandma on a couch. And Graham shares personal stories about her life and career from her early days spent pounding the pavement while waitressing in New York <laughs> to living in her aunt's couch. Oh, wow. Things have really come full circle. This is where she gets the whole grandma on a couch thing from. During her first Los Angeles pilot season, to thoughts on aging gracefully in Hollywood. Well, that's something we can all relate to. In R.I.P. Barney's New York, Graham writes about an early job as a salesperson at the legendary department store, and sometimes she inadvertently shoplifted from it. Oh, oh, stop, Lord. <laughs> uh, Ryan Gosling, in, in Ryan Gosling Cannot Confirm, she attempts to navigate the unspoken rules of Hollywood hierarchies. In Boobs of the 90s, <laughs> she worries her bras haven't kept up with the time. And in Actory Factory, she recounts a day in the life of an actor. Uh, looks like, uh, well, unless you're Brad Pitt. Filled with surprising anecdotes, sage advice, and laugh-out-loud conversations, you know, all these all-new original essays showcase the winning, award-winning charm and wry humor that have delighted Graham's millions of fans. Wow, that sounds awesome. Have I told you about this already? Uh, by Lauren Graham, uh, categories arts and entertainment, biographies and memoirs, uh, and also humor. Paperback for $18, coming out November 14th, uh, 2023. You got Amazon, Barnes Nova, Books of Mailing, Bookshop Lord, Hudson Booksellers, Powell's Target, and you know uh, that Lauren Graham has finally made it, where she can sit back 
in these golden hours of her life and just stare uh, joyfully uh, with a quiet smile nodding to herself into the setting sun as she reflects on what it's like to age in Hollywood, which I feel like we all need to be prepared for. Uh, and she, she thinks to herself, yes, now it's time for me to go. And then her head nods down and then she slowly slips away into the ether where her little astral shape just floats towards the setting sun forever because she's finally on the shel- uh, shelves of Walmart. Well, with that, uh, well, I get out of this basement, go back up to the library, and uh, read another story uh, for ha- uh, Halloween. Well, there you are. Uh, Get yourself settled in. Yes, I know the pumpkins are getting wetter. It's getting really wet in here and humid. And I know that you can basically feel the sticky pumpkin grease on the leather chair that you're sitting in. None of this is my problem. You weren't invited here to begin with. And so if you're going to sit here in my leather chairs and judge before... Every time Halloween's done, I wipe down the leather. It's fine. Uh, Why don't we get into the next story? Skeleton Lake, an episode in camp. Hey, what? An episode in camp? Like an experiment or something in cheesiness? Oh, God, what the hell's this story going to be? I can't believe the last one ended in a dream sequence, but whatever. I'm burping like crazy over here. I've had a lot of white claws. The utter loneliness in our moose camp. Oh, oh, an actual physical camp. On Skeleton Lake had impressed us from the beginning. Uh, in the Quebec backwoods, five days by trail and canoe from civilization. And perhaps the singular name contributed a little to the sensation of eeriness that made itself felt in the camp circle when once the sun was down and the late October mist began rising from the lake and winding their way amongst the tree trunks. For in these regions, all names of lakes and hills and islands have their origin from an actual event. Taking either the name of the chief participant, such as Smith's Ridge, or claiming a place on the map by perpetuating some special feature of the journey, or the scenery, such as Long Island, uh, Deep Rapids, or Rainy Lake. All names thus have their meaning and are usually uh, eh, pretty recently acquired, while the majority of the self-explanatory suggest human and pioneer relations. Skeleton Lake, therefore, was a name full of suggestion. Oh, and although none of us knew the origin of the story and its birth, oh, all of us were conscious of certain ligurious, I can't pronounce that. We're looking it up. Ligurious. <laughs> ligurious. All right, I give up. I know what the word is, but something's happening to my mouth where I just can't say it. I think I'm having a series of small strokes. Atmosphere that haunted its shores and islands, but for the evidences of the recent moose tracks in its neighborhood, we could probably have pitched our tents elsewhere. Oh, for several hundred miles in any direction, we knew of only one other party of whites. Oh, God, here we go. They had journeyed up the train with us, getting it at North Bay and hailing from Boston Way. I'm just scared that the next word I'm going to read is going to be racist. A common goal and object had served by way of introduction. We're, we're doing good so far. But the acquaintance had made little progress. This noisy, aggressive Yankee did not suit our fancy as much as possible, neighbor. And it was only in a slight intimacy between his chief guide, Jade the Swede. <laughs> Jade the Swede. I should change my name to that. One of our men that kept the thing going at all. Ah, oh, they went to camp on Beaver Creek, 50 miles uh, and more the west of us. But it was uh, six weeks ago and seemed as many months for days and nights passed slowly in these solitudes. And the scale of time changes wonderfully. Our men always seem to know by instinct pretty well. Whar them other fellows was moving. But in the interval, no one had come across our trails or no one such as heard their rifle shots. Our little camp consisted of the professor, his wife, a splendid shot, and keen woodswoman, and myself. Uh, we had a guide apiece and hunted daily in pairs from before sunrise till dark. 
It was our last evening in the woods, and the professor was lying in my little wedge tent, discussing the dangers of hunting alone in couples in this way. The flap of the tent hung back and let in fragrant odors of cooking over an open wood fire. Everywhere there was a bustle and preparation. One canoe already lay packed with moose horns and her nose pointing southwards. If an accident happened to one of them, he was saying, oh, the survivor's story when he returned to camp will be entirely unsupported evidence. Uh, wouldn't it? Uh, because, uh, you see, and he went on laying down the law after the manner of the professors until I became so bored that my attention began to wander to pictures and memories of scenes where we were just about to leave. Garden Lake with its hundred islands, uh, the rapids out of the round pond, the countless vistas of forest, crimson and gold in the autumn sunshine, and the starlit nights we had spent watching in cold, cramped positions for the wary moose on lonely lakes among the hills. Oh, oh, the hum of the professor's voice in time grew more soothing. A nod or a grunt was all the reply he looked for. Fortunately, uh, he loathed interruptions, and I think I could have almost gone to sleep under his very nose. Perhaps I did sleep for a brief interval. <laughs> then it was all about so quickly, and the tragedy of it was so unexpected and painful. Throwing our peaceful camp into a momentary confusion. Uh, that now it all seems to have happened with an uncanny swiftness of a dream. First, there was the abrupt ceasing of the droning voice, and then uh, the running of quick little steps over the pine needles, and the confusion of men's voices. In the next instant, the professor's wife was at the tent door, hatless, her face white, and her hunting bloomers banging at the wrong places. Oh, gross. Can't believe they're banging at the wrong places. A rifle in her hand, and her words running into another anyhow. Uh, quick, Harry, it's rushed in. I was asleep, and it woke me. Something's happened. You must deal with it. Uh, in a second, we were outside the tent with our rifles. My God, I heard the professor exclaim, as if he first made the discovery. It is rushed in. Well, she just said that. I saw the guys helping, dragging a man out of a canoe. A brief space of deep silence followed in which I heard only the waves from the canoe washing up on the sand. And then, immediately after, came the voice of a man talking with amazing rapidity and the odd gasps uh, between his words. And it was rushed in, telling his story in the tones of his voice, now whispering, now almost shouting, mixed with sobs and solemn oaths and frequent appeals to the deity. Somehow or another struck the false note at the very start, uh, before any of us guessed or knew anything at all, something moved secretly between his words. Uh, a shadow, failing the stars, destroying the peace of our little camp, touching all of us personally with an undefinable sense of horror and distrust. Oh, I can see the group to this day with all the detail of a good photograph standing halfway between the firelight and the darkness and the slight mist rising from the lake, the frosty stars and our men in silence. That was all sympathy. Burp, dragging Russian across the rocks toward the campfire. Their moccasins crunched on the sand and slipped several times on the stones beneath the weight of the limp, exhausted body, and I could still see every inch of the pear's cedar branch he had used for a paddle on that lonely and dreadful journey. But uh, eh, what struck me most, as it struck us all, was the limp exhaustion of his body compared to the strength of his utterance and the tearing rush of his words. Oh, a vigorous driving power was there at work, forcing out a tail, red hot and throbbing, full of discrepancies and the strangest contradictions. And then the nature, so he's a murderer, he murdered someone. And the nature of his driving power I first began to appreciate when they had lifted him into the circle of the firelight. I saw his face, gray, under the tan terror in his eyes, Tears still, a uh, hair and beard, oh, awry, and listened to the wild stream of words pouring forth without ceasing. Well, I think we all understood then, but it was only after many years that anyone dared to confess what he thought. There was Matt Morris, my guide. Silver Fizz, whose real name was uh, uh, mm, unknown, and who bore the title of his favorite drink. <laughs> and uh, a huge, huge Frank Milligan. All ears and kind intention. And, and there was Russian uh, pouring out his ready-made tell with the ever-shifting eyes, turning from face to face, seeking confirmation of details that none had witnessed but himself. And, in italics, one other. Uh, uh, Silver Fizz was the first to... 
such a stupid name, from the shock of this thing, and to realize the natural sense of chivalry common to the most genuine backwoodsman, that the man was at a terrible disadvantage. Oh, at any rate, he was the first to start putting the matter to rights. Uh, never mind telling it just now, he said in a gruff voice, uh, but with a real gentleness. Uh, get a bite to eat first, and then we'll go to her afterwards. Uh, better have a horn of whiskey, too. It ain't all packed yet, I guess. Oh, oh, couldn't eat a drink thing, cried the other. Oh, good Lord, don't you see, man? I want to talk to someone first. I want to get it out of me. <clears throat> to someone can answer. Answer. I've had nothing but trees to talk to for, th for three days, and I can't carry it alone any longer. Those cursed, silent trees. Oh, I've, I've told it to them a thousand times. Now, just see here. It was this way. When we started out for the camp, M dash, end quote, he looked fearfully about him. And we realized it was useless to stop him. The story was bound to come. And come it did! Now the story itself was nothing out of the way. Such tales are told by a dozen round any camp where, where men have knocked about the woods are in a circle. Uh, it was the way he told it that made our flesh creep. Oh, it's near the truth of all along, but he was skimming it. And skimming took off the cream that might have saved his soul. Of course, said. Uh, May I smothered it in words, odd words too, melodramatic, poetic, out of the way words that just lie on the edge of frenzy. Of course, too, he, he kept asking us each in turn, scanning our faces with those restless, frightened eyes of his. Uh, uh, what would you have done? Yeah, what else could I do? It, it was that my fault, but that was nothing for. He was no milk and water fellow who dealt in hints and suggestions. He told his story boldly forcing his conclusions upon us as if he had been so many wax cylinders of a photograph that would uh, repeat accurately would have been told us. And these questions I had mentioned, he used to emphasize any special point that he had seemed to think required such emphasis. The fact was, uh, however, the picture of what had actually happened was so vivid still in his own mind that it reached ours by a process of uh, telepathy, which he could not control or prevent. All through his true-false words, this picture stood forth in fearful detail against the shadows behind him. Now, I could not veil, uh, much less obliterate it. Uh, we knew, as I always thought, he knew that we knew in italics. The story itself, as I have said, was sufficiently ordered. Jake and himself, and I know we're finally getting the goddamn story, had uh, held... Uh, hands across the upturned craft for several hours, eventually cutting holes in her ribs to stick their arms through and grasp hands lest the numbness of the cold water should overcome them. What? They got a nine-foot canoe. Uh, they had upset in the middle of the lake. Okay, so they flipped it over in the lake. He had held hands across the upturned craft for several hours. Okay, that makes sense. Eventually cutting holes in her ribs to stick their arms through and grasp hands lest the numbness of the cold water should overcome them. How, when you're in the water, do you get to cut holes in the side of a boat? Where are the tools? They probably fell in the water. Well, that's weird. Is that just like a boating thing I just don't know enough about? Do boating people keep little tiny saws with them on their belts? All right, whatever. They were miles from shore, and then the wind was drifting down upon them on the little island, but when they got within a few hundred yards of the island... They realized their horror that they would drift after all past it. It was then that the quarrel began. Jake was for leaving the canoe and swimming. Rushton believed in waiting till they actually had passed the island and were sheltered from the wind. Then they would make the island easily by swimming, canoe and all, but Jake refused to give in. And after a short stroke, he put holes in the canoe. It's probably useless now. It's going to keep flooding. Uh, canoe and all, but Jake refused to give in. And after a short struggle, Rush had admitted there was a struggle and got free from the canoe and disappeared without a single cry. Rush had held on and proved the correctness of his theory and finally made it to the island, canoe and all. After being in the water for over five hours, he described to us how he crawled up on the shore and fainted at once with his feet lying half in water. Uh, how lost and terrified he felt upon regaining consciousness in the dark and how the canoe had drifted away in the extraordinary luck and finding it again at the end of the island by projecting a cedar branch. He told us that the little axe 
Another bit of real luck had caught in the thwart when the canoe had turned over, and how the little bottle in his pocket holding the emergency matches uh, was whole and dry. He made a blazing fire and searched the island from end to end, calling upon Jake in the darkness, but getting no answer, till finally so many half-drowned men seemed to come crawling out of the water on the rocks and vanish among the shadows when he came up with them, uh, that he had lost his nerve completely and returned to lie down by the fire till daylight came. Then he cut a bow uh, to replace the lost paddles, and after one more useless search for his lost companion, uh, he got into the canoe, fearing every moment that he would upset again, and crossed over to the mainland. And he knew roughly the position of our camping place, and after paddling day and night and making many a weary portages without food or covering, he reached us two days later. This, more or less, was the story, and we, knowing whereof he spoke, knew that every word was literally true, and at the same time went to the building up to the hideous and prodigious lie. Uh, once the recital was over, he collapsed, and Silver Fizz, after a general expression of sympathy from the rest of us, came again to the rescue. But now, mister, you just got to eat and drink, whether you've got a mind to or no. And Matt Morris... Uh, cook that night, soon had fried trout and bacon, and the wheat cakes and the hot coffee passed round uh, a rather silent and oppressed circle. So we ate round the fire ravenously, as we had eaten every night for the past six weeks. But with this difference, there was one among us who was more than ravenous. He was gorged. In spite of all our devices, he somehow crept himself to the center of observation. With the, when his little tin mug was empty, Morris instantly passed the tea pail, and when he began to mop up the bacon and grease with the, uh, the dough on his fork, Hank reached out for the frying pan, and the can of steaming boiled potatoes was always on his side. And there was another difference as well. He was sick, terribly sick, before his meal was over. And this sudden nausea after food was more eloquent than words of what the man had passed through on his dreadful, foodless, ghost-haunted journey of forty miles to our camp. In the darkness, he thought he would go crazy, he said. There were voices in the trees, and figures were always lifting themselves out of the water, or from behind boulders, <clears throat> to look at him and to make awful signs. Like what, gang signs? Uh, Jake constantly peered at him through the underbrush and everywhere the shadows were moving with eyes, footsteps, and following shapes. Well, we tried hard to talk of other things, but it was no use, for he was bursting with the rehearsal of his story and refused to allow himself the chances that were so willing and anxious to grant him. Uh, after a good night's rest, he might have had more self-control and better judgment and would probably have acted differently, but as it was, we found it impossible to help him. Once the pipes were lit and the dishes were cleared away, uh, it was useless to pretend any longer. The sparks from the burning logs zigzagged upwards into a sky brilliant with stars, and it was all wonderfully still and peaceful. And the forest odours floated up upon the sharp autumn air. Burp. The cedar fire now smelt sweet, and we could hear the gentle wash of tiny waves along the shore. All was calm and beautiful and remote from the world of man and passion. It was indeed a night to touch the soul, and yet, I think, none of us heeded these things. A bomos might have just thrust a great head over the shoulders and escaped unnoticed. Now, the death of Jake, the Swede, with his sinister setting and the real presence that held the center of the stage compelled attention. Uh, you won't perhaps care to come along, mister, said Morris, by way of beginning, but I guess I'll go with one of the boys here and have a hunt for it. Uh, sure, said Hank. Jake and I done some biggish trips together in the old days. I'll do that much for him. It's deep water, they tell me, round them islands, added Silver Fizz. But we'll find it, sure, Pop, if that's there. Well, they all spoke of the body as it. There was a minute or two of heavy silence, and then rushed in again, burst out of the story in almost identical words he had used before. It was almost as if he had learned it by heart. Oh, he wholly failed to appreciate the efforts of the others let him off. Silver Fizz rushed in, hoping to stop him, Morris and Hank closely following his lead. Oh, I once knew another traveling partner of his, he began quickly. He used to live down by Moose Jaw Rapids Way. Yeah, is that so? said Hank. Kind of useful sort of feller, chimed in Morris. 
All the idea of men had was to stop the tongue wagging before the discrepancies became so glaring that he should be forceful to take notice of them and ask questions. But just as we uh, try to stop an angry bull moose on the run or prevent Beaver Creek freezing in midwinter by throwing in pebbles near the shore, out it came, exclamation point, <clears throat> and through the discrepancy, this time was insignificant. It somehow brought us all in a second face to face with the inevitable and dreaded climax. And so I tramped all over that little bit of an island, hoping he might somehow have gotten in without my knowing it, and with always thinking, I heard that awful last cry of his in the darkness, and then that night dropped down impenetrably like a damn thick blanket out of the sky, and... That's all in quotes. All eyes fell away from his face. Hank poked up at the logs of his boot, and Morris seized an ember on his bare fingers to light his pipe. Although he was already emitting clouds of smoke, but the professor caught the ball flying. I, I thought you said that uh, he sank without a cry, he remarked quietly, looking straight up into the straightened face opposite, and then riddling mercilessly. He confused the explanation and followed. The cumulative effect of all these forces, hitherto so rigorously repressed, now made itself felt. The circle spontaneously broke up. Everybody moving at once in common instinct. The professor's wife left the party abruptly with excuses about an early start in the morning. Uh, she shook her hands with Rushton, mumbling something about his comfort in the night. The question of his comfort, however, devolved by force of circumstances upon myself. And yeah, uh, I shared my tent. Yuck. Just before wrapping up my double blankets, turd, for the night was bitterly cold, and he turned and began to explain what he had a habit of talking to sleep and hoped I would wake him if he disturbed me by doing so. Well, uh, oh, oh, he did talk in his sleep, and it disturbed me very much indeed. The anger and violence of his words remain with me to this day, and it was clear in a minute that he was living over again some portion of the scene upon the lake. And I listened, horror-struck, for a, a moment or two, and then understood that I was face-to-face uh, -face with one of two alternatives. I must uh, continue an unwilling eavesdropper, or I must waken him. The former was impossible for me, yet I shrank from the latter with the greatest repugnance. And in my dilemma, I saw the only way out of the difficulty, and at once accepted it. Cold though it was, I crawled stealthily out of my warm sleeping bag and left the tent, intending to keep the old fire alight under the stars and spend the remaining hours till daylight in the open. As, as soon as I was out, I noticed that the other figure moving silently along the shore. It was Hank Milligan. Uh, it was plain enough what he was doing. He was examining the holes that had been cut into the upper ribs of the canoe. Uh, he looked half ashamed when I came up with him and mumbled something about it not being able to sleep for the cold. But there, standing together beside the overturned canoe, we both saw that the holes were too small for a man's hand and arm. Could not possibly have cut by two men hanging on for their lives in deep water. Those holes had been made afterwards. Hank... It said nothing to me. Oh, good. I'm glad they addressed the fact that, like, if you're bouncing up and down the water, how are you going to saw holes? And where are you getting the tools from? Hank had said nothing to me, and I said nothing to Hank. And presently, he moved off to collect logs for the fire, which needed replenishing, for it was piercingly cold that night, and there were many degrees of frost. Three days later, Hank and Silver Fizz followed with stumbling footsteps in the old Indian trail that leads from Beaver Creek to the southwards. A hammock had slung between them, and it weighed heavily. Yet neither of the men complained, and indeed, speech between them was almost nothing. Their thoughts, however, were exceedingly busy, and the terrible secret of the woods, which formed the burden, weighed far more heavily than the uncouth, shifting mass that lay in the swinging hammock that tugged so severely at their shoulders. They had found, quote-unquote, it, in four feet of water, not more than a couple of yards from the lee shore of the island. And in the back of the head was a long, terrible wound, which no man could possibly have inflicted upon himself. Well, there you go. Uh, murder. Um, why don't we go down to the smoking room and perhaps snuggle up in a, in a room that's not humid with pumpkins and enjoy a cigarette while we review the two stories we just read.
Not there you are. And surprise, surprise, more sweaty pumpkins everywhere. I carved all these things three weeks ago. I thought I was going to make my place real cute. Did you notice the birds? Yeah. The birds that I, my wife put down here that all have lung cancer because we hang out in the smoking room. They all got cute little vests. Turns out you don't just get sweaters for dogs. You can buy them for birds too. Yeah. So they're all wearing cute little pumpkin vests with like a little hoodie that makes them look like they got little bat wings on their head. A bird with wings on their head. Burp. Think about it. It's adorable. Um, why don't you uh, smoke a cigarette while we uh, review the stories you read? The first story, uh, dream sequence, really? How lame could that possibly be? I know, I know. Uh, the idea that... Uh, I get flustered. The idea that he magically is going to get money from this creepy guy that walks sideways like a crab because he's trying to hide one side of his face, keeps looking at the floor. It's like, fine. Guy's got a ton of money in weird little boxes, kind of like a Russian doll, like one box after another, just pulling them all out. That's kind of weird, kind of stupid. And then, um, hey, hey, you want this money? I just need you to sign something. <laughs> and then when he gets up and he runs off uh, to go get uh, uh, Barclay, who I like to think was uh, going to take this money situation and become a, a banking uh, mastermind. <clears throat> Instead, uh, he gets up and he, he runs up and he sees the other side of the guy's face covered in blood. And then the, he sees in a mirror that the guy's smiling at him as he runs out of the room to go get Barclay. And then Barclay's dead. His throat slit. Money all over the floor. Goes back to his room. Blood all over the handle. He's really fighting with that doorknob that's all covered in blood. It's real slick. And then uh, and then so now he's got blood all over his hand. And he wipes his, wipes his forehead when he finally gets the door open. Woo! That was a lot of work. Boy, do I got a lot of sweat on me. Puts blood all over his face. And then cops come. Said, ah, you're the murderer because here's the knife on your foot. Um, uh, pretty good. It would have been good if you left it at that. Who's the mysterious man? Why is he so weird? Why is there money all over the place? Uh, just leave it there. But nope, turns out it's a dream sequence. And uh, and there's the Frenchman with the eggs. So, uh, eh, the story's okay. The other story, uh, being in the woods... Uh, was actually better. You got a guy who's overcompensating with a lot of uh, flourishes in his story about how he ended up all, uh, I don't know, crippled or something, uh, hungry, and like finally gets back to camp. Um, the murder of the guy. They found the guy. Turns out he had a wound that you could never inflict yourself. And uh, and so, okay, that's good. That's good. It's, uh, it's the murder. They're all trapped in this campground with a murderer. Uh, that you have to just tolerate. The guy who just talks too much, you have to tolerate him. Plus, he's taking all your blankets. Oh, he's so needy, so selfish. Um, fine, that's good. Why the holes in the boat? It, if the boat is upturned, you could probably give it a little flip. I imagine it's easier to flip the boat without a lot of water getting in it than it is to cut holes that you have a tool to sit and s saw holes in the boat and then put your hands through. Uh, maybe that's a weird boating thing that's actually real that I'm just ignorant of. It sounds absurd. Uh, how do you cut holes in a boat while you're bouncing up and down the water? How do you get that kind of leverage? It's like, uh, I don't know, it's like being in outer space. You're floating around in zero gravity, and you got a gun, and you fire the gun. You just go flying back for thousands of miles. Uh, imagine the same thing in a boat. Uh, you're sawing, and you keep getting pushed away from the boat, and you can't really get any leverage to get in there and finish the holes. Uh, and also, why make the holes? Just flip the boat. Less time flipping the boat without a lot of water than it would be for cutting holes. Uh, so, yeah, not the greatest stories in the world, Algernon Blackwood, but, uh, you know, other stuff he's written is a lot better. Uh, I picked these because they were roughly short and I can try to get it around an hour, uh, and now I'm paying the price here on our Halloween episode, where every room in my mansion is covered in pumpkins that are rotting and making everything pumpkin humid. Uh, so, with that, why don't you just get the hell out of my house, if you're so judgy about the pumpkin humidity here, and uh, go back to your own home for once, for for Christ's sake. What do you do? Do you sleep by my garbage cans until the next time I, I, I'm going to redo a show? Uh, well, with that, uh, happy Halloween, and, uh, and I will see you next week. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the 
part of the podcast I hate the most, where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people, not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com, which uh, just points you to my link tree. Everything's on the link tree. Just go to the link tree if you want to see where I am. And of course, uh, link tree has the dumbest URL in the world. L-I-N-K dot, no wait, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Nuzzlehouse. It's the dumbest thing. If you go to Nuzzlehouse.com, it's just going to reroute you over there. After giving you some weird error about it not being secure, I hate it. I hate the internet. But uh, if you go there, you get to hear some of the other stuff that uh, I and my wife work on, like uh, the Radio Mystery Theater show, where we try to recreate uh, the same show that used to be on in the 70s, but they don't make any episodes anymore. So we make our own, and we just steal all their commercials. Uh, And also, just in the curious mind, uh, we made a Christmas album. If you go to our link tree, you can see that we made a Christmas album. It's the first thing we did after getting married, which I think everyone should do when they get married, is start talking about the Christmas album they're going to make. And we're working on a new show where we give relationship advice by reading a paranormal smut. And since since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com but don't, uh, don't email if you're a nerdling or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left. 